we'll look at some of the practical considerations for using artificial intelligence in the security space, as well as uh, debunk a couple of myths. Well, welcome guys. You know, what I thought we would do today is talk a little bit about a bit of a contribution I made to a book on artificial intelligence for autonomous networks. It's um, edited by Mazin Gilbert here in at t Labs, and he uh, basically got together a, a large group of uh, individuals that contributed to the book. I happen to have uh, helped with the contribution in the security topic area and applying artificial intelligence, machine learning, and automation in general for security to autonomous networking. So I thought we would start out with a little bit of a discussion about what some of the motivations would be to use these types of tools in the security space. So I have a few talking points here. First one is talent, what I call talent amplification. Okay. That is, um, you know, we have a sort of a small pool of folks that really understand the nits and grits of different pieces of security technology, um, how attackers work, what it looks like to see an attack. And so what you'd like to be able to do is amplify that capability. And by doing that, that is basically have the people that understand these things be a little bit more of a teacher than a doer. Okay. And so, you know, you get good at things by doing things, but you'd like to teach them. And I think we'll be talking a little bit later about how you do the teaching of machines right. a little bit later on. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, second one is increasing scalability. That is, as I said, we have a relatively limited talent pool. And so if you want to really have the talent pool expand, what you want to be able to do is deal with, actually in two dimensions. One is to deal with more kinds of scenarios. The second would be to deal with, you know, and this is something we deal with a lot here at at and is to be able to scale and deal with lots and lots of occurrences of the same kinds of scenarios. Got it. And so you'd like to be able to uh, increase scalability. Any thoughts on that so far? So I think it's, it's interesting that you talk about talent amplification, uh, where I get sometimes when people talk about using AI, they talk about, you know, not having to have so many people in your SOC, whereas mm -hmm. you're saying you still need people in the SOC, but this is a way to help those existing folks. Absolutely. And I feel much people, <laughs> most people would probably be more comfortable with that idea in the first place. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting because I feel like there are a lot of things that as a SOC analyst, if you had AI to help you do the, the tedious parts of it, or it's like, I know already I need to do the mm -hmm. five, these five following lookups and then do some sort of mm -hmm. analysis of that in order to proceed. I mean, you can automate the lookups. You can't automate that step where you look at it and go, oh, I've seen this before, and therefore I can make these following decisions. It's interesting to see it applied in that way, I think, seeing how it directly applies to what I would do, as opposed to some of the other ways that I've seen machine learning applied in antivirus or um, network detection or things like that. So the next one here would be overcoming complexity. That is, some security analysis gets pretty complex. Yeah. And you know, the way I like to think of it is, um, you know, I think people, normal people can think pretty well in three dimensions. But think about how many attributes can feed into an analysis problem. Sure. You can have dozens of those, and to be able to kind of visualize that is really complex for a person to do. But machines can do it quite well. And so it's an opportunity to use the algorithms that is machine learning to be able to facilitate looking at more complex problems than a human could possibly do. And it, it's not, it, the other dimension of that, by the way, is you may have many attributes, but sometimes it takes many or several iterations of analysis to get to a meaningful conclusion. Yep, definitely. And so the combination of those two things is actually a dimension upon the many dimensions, right? <laughs> so so it's, a, it's dealing with that problem. Uh, next one would be expediency. That is, people can think so fast, but computers can think faster. Mm -hmm. And so we'd like to take advantage of that. And it, you know, a little bit that, that, that uh, relates to the, the uh, scaling thing. That is, it's a different parameter of scaling, but I think it's one to call out. That is, you want to be able to solve security problems really fast. Mm -hmm. And the last but not least here is accuracy. Um, and accuracy perhaps isn't the exact right term, but I thought it was the right term to show here. Okay. What I'm really talking about is consistency. Uh, it is people, you know, they get groggy, they need coffee, they need sleep. And so they will tend to make mistakes, 
whereas at least computers will be consistent. They may be wrong, mm -hmm. but they're consistently wrong and it gives you an opportunity to improve it and fix it. So these are the opportunities for being able to build upon things that may be starting out as imperfect and improve those over time. So these are the motivations. I think they're really important to kind of keep in mind because they start to drive into how you choose the right kinds of problems to solve in security space. There are certain things where machine learning really applies and artificial intelligence really applies. So it makes sense to consider what kinds of factors would influence how you would choose problems to solve with artificial intelligence. So I wanted to comment on the accuracy statement. Like I totally agree with you, but but also you know your, your machine learning models are as good as your training data, right? And and, yeah. and you're going to be using human label laborers, like you know experts that will label that data, and those humans uh, are going to have biases, right? So you may you may end up with some models that are biased, and and basically those models are going to be consistently making the, the same bad predictions uh, because of that training data. That training data that Jaime talked about is critical because if you train it wrong, if you introduce, like Jaime said, uh, a bias, you can end up mistraining that model, misdetecting uh, and, and causing yourself more trouble than it's worth with false positives. So here are a couple of things, you know, and this actually was a piece of a presentation that I was going to do at a conference and uh, didn't get the opportunity to do it. But I think there's a little bit of hype around artificial intelligence and machine really? learning and security. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite pet peeves here is, uh, you know, or the c claim is, you know, use artificial intelligence to detect and block threats real time. Now, my point of view <laughs> is if an exploit has occurred, it's already occurred. Right. You can't go and block it after it's occurred. So you block anything going on, but like <laughs> it right. happened already. Yeah. And so if you know what you can block, quite frankly, you know, if you if you if you have an idea that, you know, I could block this IP address or this, you know, this span of IP addresses, or I can block this Porter protocol, or I could block this exploit, if you have the means to do that, you should already heck, be doing it. Do that way ahead of time. Yeah. You know, figure that out ahead of time. And I think that's where you, uh, you know, to apply the artificial intelligence that is to observe the behavior of systems, activities, applications, the network, and use that to help define what doesn't need to be passed through the network. Okay, so that's, uh, that's one of my favorite ones. Uh, second one is use artificial intelligence to predict threats. To predict I, threats. Yeah, and, and yeah, I, mean, I think this is exactly along the lines of what you're referring to earlier. That is, computers can't create data that isn't there. And I don't know any computers that can read the minds of attackers yet. And really, ultimately, you know, attack comes from somebody thought up an attack or a, or a target that they're going after or a motivation. And so, you know, maybe you can think of a probability that an attack is going to occur, but you certainly can't predict the attack's going to occur. And, you know, I don't know any computers that can predict the future yet either. So, you know, I totally agree with you. Like, you know, there are a lot of misconceptions in terms of, uh, you know, machines uh, being able to predict whether an attack is going to happen. That That's very crazy. That being said, there are a couple of use cases that, that we have been uh, actively researching. One of them is, you know, are you able to predict based on, uh, you know, training data for uh, past vulnerabilities, whether a vulnerability, a particular CV is, is going gonna, is gonna to be actively exploited. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, people have had some success uh, in the past. Obviously, it's not predicting that an attack is going to happen, but as you described, Brian, is predicting what's the probability of, of uh, uh, an exploit uh, in, in, in the wild, particularly ex exploiting that, that CVE. Yeah, so let me, I'll, I'll just expand on that a bit because I think you have a very good point here that is, uh, and I see kind of two parameters here. One is that based on the type of a vulnerability, you could make some predictions about what the likelihood is that somebody is going to use that vulnerability, that is go through the trouble to create an exploit against it and use it actively in the wild. That is, it's going to be based on things like what can you gain from it, how difficult is that exploit going to be, and how broadly can you use it, and does it target systems that potentially would give you some motivation? This can you make money from it, kind of thing is what it comes down to, or uh, or gain data, or you know, capture data or, or intelligence. So very good points there, and then I think the next piece of it too is I think you know we do reporting on 
internet weather on a regular basis. And that is a, not really a prediction, but many times we see evidence of early activity that is the intent to exploit, that is part of that plan to exploit, oftentimes involves surveying the internet mm -hmm. to see if there are targets that can be exploited. And so that is a predictor of what may come later on. Hmm. It's interesting, do you, do you get to count it as, as predicting it if you've already got that initial data spike that shows someone is interested in the port? Because at that point you've already got you know, evidence. It's, a, it's this difference between you know, sans any information saying, I predict this will occur, and then looking at the data and going, oh, actually I'm gonna predict this has occurred because I've already seen it happening. It's like, well, that's not really, I wouldn't count that as a prediction necessarily. Well, not, it is, not in the Oracle sense of prediction. Yeah, not in the Oracle sense of prediction, but it's a prediction in the sense that if it only hits one or two individuals, it hasn't hit you yet. Mm -hmm. And so from a, from a individual's point of view, it is a prediction of the future in the sense. Okay. So the other example around prediction is if you are able to observe uh, a threat actor, an adversary setting up infrastructure, are you able to predict whether that infrastructure is going to be used uh, for malicious purposes in, in the future? And, you know, that's something that some people are having some success with as well. So think about you collect data from, you know, who is data, uh, new uh, services that are being set up on a daily basis, uh, what's running on, in those servers, and, and, and then you train a model to basically predict uh, whether that, that's being set up by, by a particular third actor. So that, that's exactly not predicting because, you know, the infra infrastructure is being set up at that particular point, but you are kind of predicting whether, uh, you know, those threat actors are, are going to use uh, those, uh, you know, those servers or those, those uh, domain names for, for malicious purposes. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, um, you know, if, for folks that are interested in learning more about this kind of thing, this is just a small excerpt of the security section in this book. There are a number of other topics related to uh, artificial intelligence in autonomous networks that, uh, you know, may be of interest to folks. And uh, you can go online and get that book. You know, artificial intelligence can't predict the future, but it certainly can give you insights that perhaps you wouldn't be able to get with humans alone and uh, certainly be able to extend your talent to broader areas and scale and capability through use of artificial intelligence. <laughs>